I'm going to continue my series on intercessory prayer, shaping history through prayer. About 83 years ago, there was a pastor in the downtown church in Oslo, Norway, who was discouraged. He was discouraged because there wasn't much attendance happening in his church. There wasn't very much spiritual fervor in the, you know, the lives of parishioners. And so, man, he was just despondent and... Uh, you know, one, one, one Sunday, right after the service, the custodian, who was also a member of the church, just noticed just how discouraged he was. He had just dismissed the congregation. Most of them are still in, you know, the few of them that were there were still in the auditorium. And, and uh, so he walked with the pastor and said, well, you know, pastor, what's, what's up? He says, well, I'm just, I'm just discouraged, you know. I'm just dealing with, you know, just a lack of spiritual fervor and, and, uh, Custodian said, that's okay, Pastor. I want, I want to let you know that revival is coming. And the pastor looked down and said, this doesn't look much like revival to me. And the custodian said, come with me. I want to show you something. And he took him behind the pulpit and he said, see those stains behind the pulpit there? Those are my tear stains where you, you haven't seen it. Nobody else has seen it. But in, at the nighttime, when I'm, when I'm cleaning the place, I will spend some time, I will lay on the floor and intercede. I've been weeping and crying and praying for revival, and the Lord has assured me that revival is coming. Well, at the same time, there was two women in a nearby city who were also praying for revival for Norway, and they said, Lord, if, if this is a burden from you, send two other women to pray with us. Well, the Lord did that, and there was four of them now. And then they prayed, God, send double the amount. And the Lord doubled that amount. There was eight that were praying. And they said one more time, God, double the amount. If this is for you, from you, God sent eight more people. Now there were eight, excuse me, 16 women that were praying and the janitor for revival in Norway. Well, sometime later, the youth were having a service Sunday afternoon before the evening adult service. And... Uh, you know, there wasn't much interest in, in, in the youth. They were kind of uh, restless. The youth pastor was having a difficult time, you know, keeping their attention. But it was that moment that God chose to interrupt and answer prayer. Suddenly, a white cloud began to descend from the ceiling. The youth leader saw it first, and he said, as it, the lower it came, the more restless that the students became until it finally touched their heads. And one of the observers wrote this. He said, instantly, without any outward signal, all the youth fell to their knees praying, weeping, and confessing their sins. Well, the youth service continued over, spilled over into the adult service, and the adults did the same thing. They began to weep and begin to confess their sins. <coughs> Excuse me. If I do that a couple of times, I'm just getting over a cold, which is strange for me, particularly this time of year. But, uh, you know, there was just a sense of brokenness and, and humility in the presence of God uh, in that place. Well, um, even though there was no service scheduled the rest of the week, the very next night, all the youth and most of the adults came back to the church. They just wanted to be in God's presence and experience what God was doing. Well, it happened the next night and the next night. And it continued for 12 years. 12 years, revival had hit the country of Norway. It spread through other churches in the city. It spread throughout the nation. And in Oslo alone, 20, 000, in just the city alone, 20,000 people came to Christ. How many know the janitor knew something that apparently the pastor didn't know? And that is the power of intercession. So listen, 17 people. 16 women, one janitor, praying for a revival, dedicated to it over a period of time, and God heard those prayers and broke through, and revival came. You know, the most powerful people on earth are not presidents, they're not kings, they're not dictators. It's people who know how to intercede, who know how to touch the heart of God. And you know, it's very important that the church today learn how to intercede Learn how to, you know, heed that urgent call of the Holy Spirit and touch the heart 
of God. You know, you've probably heard if you watch the news, the, the, the term thin blue line. You know, that references uh, the, our law enforcement who are that line between the good guys, that's us, and the criminals who want to take advantage of us and hurt us. Well, how many know that the church is the line between Satan and everything that he wants to do against humanity? And he's out there to steal, kill, and destroy. I know James Dobson, I've quoted this three times now, that he said there's a battle for the soul of this nation. Let me just add, there's a battle for the soul of your family and your marriage and your children. You know, just because you raise your kids in church doesn't mean they're going to grow up and, and leave home and just serve God, you know, passionately for the rest of their lives. No, Satan has a plan for their life just as much as God has a plan for their life. And we're going to have to do, as parents, we're going to have to do some interceding and some spiritual battle in, in order to see God's plan done in their life. Now, let me just define intercession again. I know some of this is review, but how many know you don't get it just because you hear it one time? The word intercession simply means to stand between. To stand between. Stand between what? Two things. Number one, you stand between God and someone, some individual, or maybe even some city, or even some nation that is very deserving of the wrath and the judgment of God. And we see that happening all through the Old Testament. Sodom and Gomorrah is an example of where the judgment came on, on, upon an entire city. Judgment came upon the nation of Israel, an entire nation, more than one time because of their disobedience and their, their rebellion. They deserved it and, and it, and it came. But at the same time, an intercessor can stand between that and make a difference and actually shape history in that nation, in that city, or in that Individual. That's what Moses did in Exodus 32 when the, uh, the, the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, whom God had just delivered with mighty miracles out of slavery, 400 years of slavery, miraculously opened up the Red Sea, miraculously were feeding them, taking them through the wilderness to the promised land. Moses goes up on the mountain to get a word from God of the Ten Commandments. And what's happening? Israel is down there. They're making a calf of gold and worshiping the, the, the idol instead of God. And so that kind of ticks God off a little bit. How I many know oh, God can get ticked off? You know, if you want to use that term. And basically, what he said to Moses is get out of the way. I'm done with these people. It's over. And what did Moses do? Have your way. I never really liked them all that much anyway. They were kind of getting on my nerves. No, he stood between God and God's judgment. Even though God loves mercy, he's a just God and, and judgment had to come. Moses stood between, listen to what he said in Exodus 32 verse 11. But Moses implored, implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? He said, why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains, consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you're you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the land that I have promised, I will give your offspring and they shall in inherit it forever. You know, as a result of Moses' intercession, God spared the nation. And guess what? That's what he wanted to do anyway. You know, it really is. Uh, the heart of God, God always prefers to extend mercy and forgiveness rather than judgment but he can only do that when he finds somebody who will pray, somebody who will intercede. And then secondly, we stand between people, humanity, and Satan, a malevolent foe he wants, who wants to bring destruction into their life. John 10, 10, you all know the scripture, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and have it to the full. You know, it's amazing to me how many Christians get those two job descriptions mixed up. They think God is the one that's doing the stealing, killing, destroying. 
And I want to tell you, Jesus came to bring abundant life. Let's not get that mixed up. Let's not get that confused. If there is destruction, if there's killing, if there's mayhem, if there's confusion in the planet Earth, it is not God. That's not what He is up to. Jesus came to give us abundant life. Satan is the one that's trying to destroy every nation, every city, every individual, every, every marriage, your children. That's what he's up to. Jesus said, I'll come to give you life. Tell somebody, I'm glad I'm on the right side. You know, intercessors are the people who are standing between Satan's efforts to bring destruction in all of humanity. You know, we see a, an example of this in our courts every day when lawyers representing their clients, clients stand between their client and somebody who wants to take advantage of them. We had an experience of this in our, our own life um, a couple years ago. Uh, my wife and I are still paying for the automobile insurance for our, our adult children. And I pray often, God, help them to get good jobs so they can start paying for their own car insurance. Because I'm tired of doing it. Everybody say, what a good dad. But anyway, a couple years ago, my oldest daughter was down in Las Vegas where she lived. She was going to college at the time. She was on her way to school on the freeway. It was raining. She was driving the speed limit. But she was probably a little bit too close to the car in front of her. Can you guys hear me all right? Okay. A little too close to the car in front of her. And that lady, as an older lady, slammed on her brake for some reason. And Anessa slammed on her brake, but slid into her anyway and bumped her on the back. And it wasn't a big collision. There really wasn't that much damage done to the car. And the lady got out, and they both got out. And she seemed fine. She didn't mention anything about being heard at all, and they had a nice little conversation, and police came and handled the whole thing. Well, a few weeks later, I got a call from the insurance that she was suing for damages. She had actually, we found out later, she went to six different doctors until she found one who would, you know, say, yeah, you got your neck hurt in the accident. The first five said, no, I don't see anything wrong with you. But finally, she found some quack, you know, that would say, yeah, yeah, you got a whiplash, and, and so she got a, some kind of lawyer, and uh, they sued the insurance company for the full amount of, uh, uh, what, what do they call that, uh, personal, personal injury, the personal injury limits. I think, it, I think we carry $100,000 or something like that. Anyway, full, to the full extent, they sued. But you know what? She wasn't happy with that. She came after our personal assets. She wanted to come after our house our cars, everything that we owned. She wanted to sue us for everything that we had. And thankfully, I mean, I'm thinking, I'll tell you what, I start praying. You, do, you, do you ever want motivation to pray? Just let something like that happen to you. I start hitting my knees. Oh, God. <laughs> I mean, I pray anyway, but man, I prayed intensely. And fortunately, the insurance company Sick. They're, they're lawyers. I was thinking, I'm going to have to hire lawyers. I don't have money for all of that. And they put their lawyers at no cost to me on the case, and they literally stood between this lady who wanted to take advantage of us and me. And praise God, I never heard a thing about it. I don't know exactly what happened, but they never got a dime from us. And really, I don't think they got all that much from the insurance company by the time they got, got through with it. What a great example, though, and that's exactly what we, as individual Christians and as the church of Jesus Christ on planet Earth can do. We can stand between the enemy who wants to take advantage of us, hurt, steal, accuse, everything, and stand between that and, and God's people. Hallelujah. Well, I want to give you three truths about intercession this morning. Number one, some of this is review and some is new. Number one, God acts when people pray. I know I've been hammering this, but like I said, you don't get it just because you hear it one time. 
You know, if you've been waiting for God to do something, maybe he's waiting for you to pray. You ever thought about that? You know, from the beginning of time, God has chose to work through people and not independent from them. I spent the first message in this series just talking about all of those dynamics. But God's plan for working in nations, in cities, in your family, in this church, is to find people who will pray, who will, number one, hear the heart of God, not just pray anything they want, but number one, hear the heart of God. God, what do you want done in planet Earth? What do you want done in the life of Mitch or in the life of Scott or in Covenant Church or in the Dallas City or the Mid-Columbia area? God, what is it that you're doing that you want done? You hear the heart of God. You tune your ear into heaven, number one. And then second, you pray that thing out until it manifests on planet Earth. Sometimes you've got to push. You know what that stands for? Pray until something happens. You're willing to pray until something happens. That God's kingdom that originated in heaven, in his mind, in his heart, he knows what needs to be done. And you're standing on earth as the person that God has delegated authority to, and you pray that out until it happens. That's plan A. You know what plan B is? There is no plan B. Sorry to tell you. No plan B. God, you don't have a plan B? Everybody's got a plan B. No, God has no plan B. It's plan A, and if we don't pray, nothing gets done. Nothing happens until you pray. One of our key scriptures for this series, and share it again, Ezekiel 22, verse 30. God said, I look for someone who would build up the wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land. Stand between, intercede. That's what he's talking about. So that I would not have to destroy it, but I found none. What a sad scripture. What a sad commentary that God was longing to bring uh, mercy and forgiveness instead of judgment if he could only find one person to pray, but he could not find that person. And so the consequences had to come. You know, I know God's sovereign. You know, people throw that at me all the time. And sovereignty means that he is the supreme authority in all of the universe. And if God wanted to, I'm sure that he could control every little action on planet Earth. But he has chosen not to do that. Number one, he's given you free will. Number two, he's made us the, uh, he's given us as human beings the dominion over planet, in planet Earth. And so really, it's up to us. When we pray, God will act. He's ever ready. He's ever ready. I said he's ever ready to act. There's no hesitancy with God. We don't have to rouse him from sleep. We don't have to twist his arm. God wants to work. He's longing to work. He loves humanity. He wants to heal broken people. He wants to restore lives that have been literally destroyed by the enemy. He so longs to work, but he needs somebody to pray. Nothing happens until we pray. We don't like the way things are in our nation, in our city, our our own personal lives, our family. Let's pray. When we do, God will act. Here's the second truth. Intercession is praying from victory and not for victory. You know, it's important that we understand the difference. You know, one of the great things about serving Christ is that we're on the winning side. I want to tell you, I took a sneak peek. I read the back of the book, and we win. We're on the winning side. Jesus Christ has already conquered our enemy. Hallelujah. I love this scripture, Colossians 2.15, and talking about Jesus and having disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. I like the Phillips version. Jesus exposed them, shattered, empty, and defeated in his final glorious triumphant act. And here's the... 
Here's, I thought there was another version there, but I guess I don't have it. Here's, here's another scripture, Revelation 1, 18. Jesus said, and I hold the keys of death and of hell. How many know keys represent authority? Jesus is saying, uh, you know, God originally gave dominion and authority over to, in the earth over to Adam. But through disobedience, Adam transferred that over to the enemy, over to Satan. But praise God, through the cross, through the resurrection, Jesus reclaimed the keys. He said, I got them now. Satan had them, but I got them now. I got the keys of death and of hell. I've got the authority. And then guess what? He turned around and gave it right back to us. What the scripture said, Jesus said in Luke 10, 19, I have given you authority. Who is he talking to? Is he just talking to the 12, 12 apostles? I mean, that's originally who he was talking to. But through, in talking to them, he was talking to us. We're his disciples. We're his followers. He said, I've given you authority. Tell your neighbor, he's talking about you. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means harm you. So even though we're, we're battling demonic forces, we're battling uh, from victory and not for victory. So in essence, Jesus won the victory on planet earth 2,000 years ago, and he's left us to enforce the victory in our generation. You know, you heard about the Terminator? Look out, here comes the enforcer. That's who we are. Tell, you, tell, tell your neighbor, you're looking like an enforcer right now. That's what Jesus has left us to do. I mean, if it's just a matter of getting to heaven, then the minute that you, you are, you know, you say that sinner's prayer, then uh, Michael the archangel hits the, what does he call that thing on Star Trek? The uh, transponder or whatever they call it. Transporter, that's what it is, the transporter. I got to get back to my Star Trek, and you know, I'm losing touch here. You know, Mike, Michael just hits the button on the transporter, and it just beams you up to heaven. But it's not a matter about just getting to heaven. He's left you here for a reason to enforce the victory that he won 2,000 years ago on the cross. You know, a great example of this, and Dutch Sheets brings this out in his book on intercessory prayer, which I recommend. But he mentions there was a battle that Joshua was fighting. They won the battle, defeated, uh, I think, multiple kings in that situation. And tradition was that the winning king would, would make the defeated kings lay down on the ground, and he would put his foot on their neck as a symbol of victory. I conquered you. You know, you're under my feet. But in that particular case, instead of Joshua doing it, even though he was the, the leader, he just called one of his men, just one of the ordinary men over and said, you put your foot on his neck. And he did that. And I think what a great picture. Jesus defeated Satan 2,000 years ago, but he's telling us, you go ahead and put your foot on his neck. How many know Satan is under our feet? We're seen with Christ in the heavenly realms. That means everything is under our feet. Hallelujah. Woo. Glory to God. Here's the third truth. Intercession is contending for what God intends. Contending for what God intends. The word contend indicates a struggle, a battle, wrestling. Two, two wrestling opponents on the mat are contending with one another to see who can get the other one down and pin them. You know, even though we're, we're battling from victory and not for victory, how many know there's still a battle? There's still a battle. Go ahead and tell your neighbor, there's still a battle. <laughs> I know some of you are thinking, I don't want to hear that. I'm not listening to that. You know, I, I, I'm not into that spiritual warfare, so I didn't sign up to fight. I signed up, number one, to get my needs met, and then I signed up to get that one-way ticket to heaven. That's all I'm interested in. I got some maybe good news, bad news, or however you take it. You're in the battle. You're getting shot at. You might as well learn how to shoot back. And
And here's the good news, your weapons are bigger than the enemy's. <laughs> yeah! Our weapons are greater than the enemy's. Hallelujah! Name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the power of prayer, intercession. Man, our weapons, weapons that God has given us are powerful to demolish strongholds, cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Hallelujah. Thank God for his weapons. But there's still a battle. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers, the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly realms. You know, unfortunately, a lot of Christians read that scripture and they stop after the first five words. And we do not wrestle. Period. I'm out. That's why a lot of Christians are leave, le leading defeated lives. Because they haven't learned how to wrestle spiritually. Take up the weapons. Take up the armor. You're in a battle whether you like it or not. You can stick your head in the sand, but the enemy's going to shoot your butt. <laughs> Whatever's sticking up out of the sand, he's going to get. Man, we got to learn how to go on the offense. we got to contend for what God intends for our marriages for our families for our church for our nation and I tell you our nation is in bad shape right now there are demonic forces trying to work through people trying to lift people up into places of influence that don't care about religious freedoms don't care about the Constitution don't care about the lives of unborn children they want to take this nation you know into you know, big government control, socialism, which is really a transition, Karl Marx said, just into communism. You know, we don't want our children, our grandchildren growing up in that. So we're going to have to contend for what God intends. Nehemiah said this, and it's a word for every single one of us. Nehemiah 4.14, remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families. Fight for your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. You've got to fight. There's a battle. You know, one Christian writer said, it's time for Christians to get off, the, get off the charismatic love boat and onto the Christian battleship. <laughs> I kind of like that. Time for Christians to get off the charismatic love boat and onto the Christian battleship. Now, if you're a millennial, you probably don't even know what the love boat is. That, that was a TV show in the 80s, I think it was. It was about a cruise ship, and it was all just one big party. You know, that's all it was. But I tell you what, it's time for the church to get out of the party mode and into the battle mindset. Time for the church to rise up, begin to use the authority that God has given us. Someone said, uh, you know, I, I really think that we've been on the defense too long. You know, we've been passive as a church. You know, for decades it's been okay. It's been okay to be passive because generally we've had God-fearing people and governmental leadership and, you know, you know maybe they weren't Christians, but... You know, they seem to be at least respectful of, of Christianity and the moral laws of God. I want to tell you, that is gone. That time is gone. We're in a post-Christian era. And I say, you know, the people that are rising up into power do not love this nation, do not love God, care nothing about the religious freedoms. And it might have been okay for decades to be passive. But we've been passive. It's been a little bit like the frog in the water. Slowly but surely, we've seen our religious freedoms erode. We've seen big government trying to take control. We've seen, since 1973, over 60 million unborn children killed through a legalized abortion. Now, we could go on. I'm not trying to, you know, discourage you today or depress you. Why did I come to church to hear that? The good news is the church is equipped to go on the offense. We just got to get the right mindset. We just got to get in the battle mindset. Somebody said the best defense is a good offense, right? And I, I found this quote. I didn't know he said this. But George Washington, our first president, great general, he said, offensive operations are the surest, if not the only, means of defense. At some point, we got to go on the offense as a church and draw the line and say, this is enough. Not taking this anymore.
We're not doing this anymore. We're not going to let our nation go down the drain. I'm not going to let the enemy steal my kids. I'm not going to let the enemy wreck my marriage. I'm just not doing it anymore. Jesus said that his praying church would be an offensive weapon against the powers of darkness. The thin blue line, the thin line, that's us. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know, some people read that scripture somehow and they see the church is kind of huddled over in the corner and the gates of hell, whatever the gates are, you know, are, are, are pounding against the church and somehow, you know, the church is going to hold on until Jesus comes. That is not what that scripture is talking about. You know, in the Old Testament times, Cities were protected by walls and gates. That's how they protect themselves against the onslaught of the enemy. And the weakest point in all of that defense was the gates. And so if an enemy army would come and try to attack and take over the city, they would try to break down or burn down uh, the gates. And if they could break down the gates, they could take the city. So Jesus is talking about a church that is on the offense and not the defense. He said his church is going after the gates of hell, after the very powers of hell, the power center of hell, and those gates will not be able to withstand us. That's what Jesus is saying. We're not on the defense. Oh, God, protect us from the end. No, we're on the offense. We've taken up the sword of the Spirit, the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and we're going after the enemy. I like uh, another version, the CEB version of this, Matthew 16, 18. Jesus said, I will build my church on this rock, and the gates of the underworld won't be able to stand against it. Here's the message version. I will, I will put together my church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. Here's another version, the voice. The church will reign triumphant even at the gates of hell. Hallelujah. Jesus is not building a pathetic, wimpy church. I want to tell you that. The church that he is building is going to know its authority. It's going to move in power on the earth. It's going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And it's going to destroy the very strongholds of the enemy in our nation, in our city, in our family. Hallelujah. God's church is rising up. And it's time for the church to rise up. How many are ready to join the army? Get off of the charismatic love boat and onto the battleship. Hallelujah. You know, we're called to rule with God in prayer. Hallelujah. We're called to rule with God in prayer. That's how we do it. That's the primary way we do it, specifically the prayer of intercession. And... Uh, I just want to tell you, through prayer, we can shape history. Through prayer, we can see our marriages restored. Through prayer, we can see revival come to this nation. Hallelujah. I'm excited about it. I want to give you, as we end, three practical steps. Number one, dedicate time to intercede. Dedicate time. Two weeks ago, I gave you four areas to pray about. Good government, uh, the lost, our city, and uh, just one another. Just one another, as God would... Put you on the hearts of someone else. And if we won't, if we don't intentionally, there's some things we got to do intentionally. And if we don't intentionally set aside time to intercede, I, I, you may have the greatest intentions. You may, after hearing this message, walk out the parking lot thinking, man, I'm going to get involved in intercession more. But I want to tell you, if you don't do some things intentionally, put it in your calendar, know when you're going to do it. The, the cares and busyness of life is just going to crowd out those good intentions. You've got to be very specific about when you're going to pray. Get it on your calendar. That's why we have these corporate prayer meetings. So you can come, put it on your calendar, and be a part of what God's doing. Secondly, you need to have a prayer plan. Have a prayer plan. You're, 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 when you go to intercede, you ought to have some specific prayer topics that you've written out in advance, you've thought about it, they're scriptural based, and that doesn't mean you're locked into those, the Holy Spirit can lead and, and guide how he wants, but you start out with a prayer plan, 
about how you're going to pray for the president, our nation, pray for the city, pray for the lost, pray for one another. You know, David in uh, Psalms 5.3, I'm almost done here, just give me a couple more moments. Psalms 5.3, he says, My voice you will hear in the morning. O Lord, in the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. That word direct is the word Hebrew word arak, A-R-A-K. And that word literally means, it describes an army being set in array or having a battle strategy. So what David is saying is here, he directed his prayer to God. He had a, he had a daily, well-thought-out prayer strategy when he came to God. It wasn't just some off the cuff, and I know the Holy Spirit can lead us, and I, I let the Holy Spirit lead me all the time in prayer. But sometimes, particularly when it comes to interceding for these key issues, we need to have some things well thought out, a, a well thought out ordered strategy, and we just hit those things. And sometimes we hit them again and again and again. We push, we pray until something happens. Hallelujah. Here's the third thing. Pray with others whenever possible. I know God hears your prayers, but there is a spiritual dynamic that happens when you get together with other people. Jesus said, Jesus said this, Matthew 18, that truly I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about anything that they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. I want to finish with this story. John G. Lake was a missionary in South Africa a few decades ago. And while he was down there, there was a plague that hit, a devastating plague, and thousands of people were dying. And he, he writes this, John G. Lake, he said, As I rode through this section of the country, I found men dead in their beds beside their wife, children dead in their beds alongside the living, whole family stricken and dying and dead. In a single month, one quarter of the entire population of that district, both white and black, died. We had to organize an army of men to dig graves and make caskets. We couldn't buy wood enough in that section of the country to make caskets, so we buried them in a blanket or without a blanket when it was necessary to save the blanket for a better purpose. Now, Lake had an associate, doesn't mention him by name, and he said it was a man who knew how to pray. He was a man who, who spent time with God, knew how to touch the heart of God. And this man went to prayer. He actually got himself under a tree. South Africa, warm climate. Got himself under a tree, and he stayed there for days. Did not leave. And John G. Lake said, uh, he said, I passed this way in the morning. I hear, hear his voice in prayer. When I returned in the evening, I would hear his voice in prayer. Said many times I got a prepared meal and carried out to him and aroused him long enough to get him to eat it. And I'd say, brother, how is it? Are you getting through? And he would reply, not yet. Then one day, Lake went to visit him and the man said, Mr. Lake, I feel like today that if I just had a little help in my faith, that my spirit would break through into God. So I went, to, I went to my knees beside him. I joined my heart with his, and we prayed together to see this plague stopped. As we prayed, the Holy Spirit opened my eyes, and I saw a multitude of demons like a flock of sheep. My friend saw it too, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he rushed ahead of me, cursing that army of demons, and they were driven back to hell or the place where, wherever they came from. The next morning when we awoke, that epidemic was gone. That is the power of the prayer of agreement. When people get together and pray, God hears and God answers. Listen, I believe the trumpet of heaven is blowing a sound in order to rally the troops, in order to rally an army of intercessors who will begin to pray perhaps like they've never prayed before, who will wake up and realize that if we don't pray, our lives, our nation will not be what we want it to be. It will not be what we've experienced in the past. It will be something much, much different. Something that we don't want. Something we don't want for our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. God's blowing the trumpet. There's a sense of urgency that is beginning to rise up. 
in the hearts of people. We've spent decades just being able to be on that charismatic love boat, rejoicing in God. Lord, give me more. Holy Spirit goosebumps. I'm all for that. I'm all for the infilling Holy Spirit. Man, if it was just up to me and I just have a party all the time, God just increase it. And I think God wants to bring times of refreshing from his presence. But I tell you what, we're going to have to join the army. We're going to have to have a well-ordered battle strategy in prayer. We're going to have to join forces. We're going to have to raise up our voice like we never have before and begin to intercede and say, God, your kingdom come. Your will be done. We are that thin line. We are the, the only force on planet earth that is going to be able to stand between what Satan is trying to do and all of humanity and what God has redeemed in the hearts and lives of people. Hallelujah. Are you going to be part of that army? That's the question. Are you going to be part of that army? Let, let's stand together. You know, we've been praying, or talking, I'm sorry, we've been speaking about prayer and intercession. But I want to address somebody this morning. You may be here, you may be watching online. And there's an emptiness on the inside of you, there's a void. You know, God created us have a relationship with him. He created us to need him. And if we're not living in relationship with him, there is a void, there's a vacuum on the inside, there is a, there is a pit, there's a darkness. I remember that feeling still after almost 40 years of walking with Christ. Thank God he's really never let me forget that. I remember what that felt like. Just an emptiness, a darkness, a restlessness. I would try everything that society that the world had to offer to try to fill that. But I woke up the next day, not only with a hangover, but with the same emptiness that I had the night before. And it was only when I invited Jesus Christ into my life to be my Lord and Savior that he once and for all filled that void, filled that emptiness. Doesn't mean life has been a, you know, all easy. But I've never gone a day without the sense of God's presence. I don't have that restlessness, that emptiness anymore. He's the missing piece to the puzzle. And if that's you today, uh, I'm not even going to ask for a show of hands because uh, you may be here, but you may be, well, I just sensed this morning, there might be somebody watching online. And you've never made that decision. You've never invited Jesus Christ into your life. He is waiting. The scripture says that he's standing at the door, knocking at the door of your heart. And the only thing that's keeping him out is you. If you, he's never, he's a gentleman. He's never going to barge in. But if you open the door with a simple prayer, say, Jesus, I need you. I'm tired of living this empty life. I'm tired of living without purpose, without a sense of destiny. I need you in my life. If you say a simple prayer, and I'll lead you in that prayer, Jesus will come in He'll begin to transform you. He'll fill that, that void in your life. Let's just pray this prayer together. Can you all of you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. I confess that I am a sinner and I need a Savior. Forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse my heart of all unrighteousness. Come into my heart. Fill up the void. Teach me how to be a follower of Jesus. And help me to live for you the rest of my days. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah.